And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the way from Erland Games, the the creators of the upcoming, well, in development, the realm of Guy and Enoch, the one and only Tony Rowland. How are you doing tonight, man? Excellent. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. Happy to have you on. Um, it is a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it really kind of stick? Um, my first introduction to role-playing games, uh, this is all the way back, um, I think I was 11 at the time, and I, I walked into a, a comic shop, baseball comic shop, um, mm -hmm. Kent, Ohio, a place called um, uh, Spellbinders in, in Kent, Ohio, mm -hmm. and I, the first thing I saw when I walked in was the uh, Red Box D&D, &D, um, Larry Elmore art, mm -hmm. and I was like, hmm. I kind of got to have that. So we bought it, and it kind of went from there. Let's see. So, well, for start, well, for starters, that's the exact same. Re that's the exact same red box I have. So I'd say that'd probably be um, Beck Me era, um, which is what is the one that seems to pop up a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Whenever, whenever people, whenever people get into get into the hobby it's usually either that or bx right yeah oh. that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. but with the with the realm of guy and enoch um now is the, now you've dis you've described it as a game of post of post-apocalyptic horror mm -hmm. and the thing that i find interesting about that is a lot of time whenever someone is doing a post-apocalypse Nine times out of ten, they're doing it in the science fiction end of things. There's not a whole lot of cases that do it in a fantasy sense. What was your inspiration to do a fantasy post-apocalypse? Um, a, a lot of it. Um, I, I, you know, for a long time, um, you know, I was a big World of Darkness fan. Mm -hmm. I, I played a ton of, of World of Darkness, um, and I always liked the kind of darker, grittier theme. Um, and I always thought, you know, I could do something in a fantasy type, you know, world. And then I kind of started getting into like more of the, you know, the horror aspect of it. And like, I don't know, the, the just the idea of, you know, a, a post-apocalyptic fantasy world um, kind of drives a story. Mm-hmm. And since since you mentioned World of Darkness, I'm curious which um, which games within the World of Darkness meta series you ended up leaning more towards. Uh, I played a ton of Vampire: The Dark Ages. It's given given then given what you're given what you're developing now it can definitely uh, makes sense. Um, although when it when when it came to the ter when it came to the term Guy and Enoch. Um, I'm cur I'm curious where the where the uh, name came from because now obviously um I have my own familiarities with with a name like Enoch it brings to mind the uh, Book of Enoch but what were you trying to shoot for with that kind of name? Um, it, well the the term Gaian actually mm -hmm. integrates into the, the the really the idea of the whole game system where mm -hmm. um you know you're 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 playing a hero right a Gaian hero mm -hmm. and and you know Gaia being you know the the the, the spirit of life um, in this post apocalyptic world, um, part of you know part of the story is that um, you know one of your ever present enemies, which would be your you know your shades of the undying, their goal is really to exterminate life and really to end their own life. Mm -hmm. um, and and you as sort of that guy and hero, um, you're kind of the protector of life. And and of course Enoch, um, you know, it's a you know biblical referen reference reference mm -hmm. um, to the first city. Yeah. 
And the when when it comes when it comes to that, would you would you say that even even though it's going with post apocalyptic horror that um that the characters within the player characters within the realm of Guy and Enoch lean a little lean a little bit more into the heroic end compared to other post apocalyptic games? Yeah, definitely. Um and it's it, in the in the game setting, um, you know, you are you are this hero. You have this, this power this this that's kind of been gifted to you, mm -hmm. um, and it's all about what you're going to do with it, right? Because the world is in a bad place, you know, it, 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 the culmination of the War of Ashes. Mortals only just barely survived, and they're not doing well. The world's not doing well at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know where where you know there's nowhere else to go. You know, you can't retreat any further. So someone has to go out there and do something, and that someone is you. Yeah. And the ma the main reason wh the main reason why I bring why I bring up this kind of thing is when you look when you look at a lot of dark fantasy and even a lot of um, post apocalyptic um, fiction, there's a vi there's a very lack of hope type of uh, type of approach. Um, mm -hmm. Some sometimes more cynical than others but generally there's the mindset of the world is fucked and everybody's just trying to survive what's left but right but the vibe that i'm getting from what you're de from how you're describing it is that while the while the world is while the world is certainly screwed it doesn't mean that it's um permanently screwed well right exactly and and you know there's there's a light at the end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. but it's very very faint. Yeah. And, and you know it, if you if you don't do anything about it, um, you know the 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 apocalypse that you just barely avoided, and, and the game sitting really takes off just after this long, you know, horrible war. Um, you know, it, it it could easily go either way, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, part of the, the storytelling aspect of it is, you know, you have this power, right? You have this, these abilities, but you're still you, right? You're, you're still this, this person, you know, that, that you've acquired these abilities, um, but what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, you know, that's where we explore the idea of what does it mean to be a hero, you know? Um, and then some of the little grittier dark side of that is... You know, does being a good guy mean being a nice guy? Maybe not necessarily. You know, especially in that in that type of a world. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that's why you know in the in the design I specifically omitted any sort of morality system at all. There there is none. You know, um, there's no there's no good there's no evil there's no you know what I mean they're, 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 these are you know. Um, I don't say campy, but they're they're really subjective terms. I'd it's also really I'd also say that the um some some sort of abject morality si morality system, whether it be the alignments that D and D has, or even the concept of um humanity that's in um vampire, wouldn't qu wouldn't quite fit with what you're doing. Right, and then we get into the argument of you know, is. Do, am I playing my character's alignment or is my alignment based on how I play? You know, and then you, you go back and forth, mm -hmm. like a character of this alignment wouldn't do this. Well, then doesn't that mean that I'm not that alignment? All hail lawful stupid. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's really what I want to kind of get away from, especially with the idea of like a hero. You know, like you don't have to have a Superman complex. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's no stark white good and dark black evil yeah. you know it's, it's i don't know I, that 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 to me is is not good storytelling and you know i'm th the reason i'm well it's it the alignment system in something like D&D is an is an easy target but i but i have to aim that barb as at um the humanity system in vampire as well now granted it work now granted it certainly um work it certainly works for vampire but the problem is with with those kind of setups, you ha you have the notion of your character is a ticking bomb, right? And 
you can stay you can stay you can add time to the timer but the ti but in some form the timer is always going to be at the back of your mind right yep i mean i i went as so as far as to say that there are certain words that are like forbidden from being used in any of the text and and a lot of those are like good and evil mm -hmm. and angel and demon and you know what i mean all, all of these all these classic terms because i, I think it, it's oversimplifies things like it's not very descriptive to call someone evil you know are they malicious are they spiteful are they you know what i mean like mm -hmm. there, there's there's a lot there's a lot more interesting ways you can describe them and even going as so far to say that you know that the bad guy isn't always a bad guy mm -hmm. you know like you, you you're you're really you're getting into like really poorly written stock characters you know yeah not every bad guy is a psychopath that kills every third person that he meets you know like he might have a mom that he loves mm -hmm. you know like it's you know it, i think it's it's a it's a better narrative that way yeah and Something that I did find interesting, since you mentioned um, the world of darkness being a significant influence on you, is the is the um, die system that you're you, that you're using, mm -hmm. where you're using if I'm if I'm reading this correctly, you're using a um, D8 based die pool that focuses more on the t the um, total result rather than the number of successes, like what World of Darkness does. Yes. And there's a reason for that. Um, in, in a in a mathematical sense, um, that system is a little bit flawed. Um, particularly when you start talking about like a difficulty ten roll, mm -hmm. where uh, technically speaking, it's best to roll one die than it is to roll multiple dice, because you can't you you can't cancel your ten out with a botch. You can botch the whole roll, but if you roll one single 10, you succeed. Mm -hmm. Much easier on one die than it actually is on two. Yeah. Now, I've, now in addition to that, you do have a um, semi-exploding mechanic with the, with the rule of eight. The fact that mm -hmm. when, whenever a single die rolls an eight, you, you, add, another, you add another die. And um, I've seen people go both ways on the on the nature of exploding dice where some people like the surprise that it adds other people find that it makes res it makes some results way too swingy um what was the reasoning you had for putting in that explosion rule uh because it's fun um <laughs> the, the 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 number one rule in anything is 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 if it's not fun get rid of it mm -hmm. but it's it's fun and it's fun to be at a disadvantage and then somehow come out ahead right like, and that rule of eight only applies to players. Your enemies don't get that that advantage. You get that advantage yeah. because you're 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 the, the story's based on you. You're the hero. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, more or less enemies are disposable. You know what I mean? Players and characters aren't. You know, so they should sometimes succeed, and that goes all the way back to the first rule, rule of one, where you always have one die to roll. There's mm -hmm. always a chance, no matter what the penalty is. You, and you can take that one die and you can explode it, you know, get an exploded success and somehow miraculously turn uh, what would normally be failure into some sort of success. Right. Yeah. And that's fun. And that's the thing you remember as a player, you know, like, oh, my God, remember that time he was rolling 10 dice and I was rolling three, but I rolled three eights and I rolled three more eights. And I, you know what I mean? And, and mm -hmm. I somehow. Won, right. Yeah. That's fun. Um. I'm guessing the rule. I'm guessing the rule of ten was to minimize the possibility of dealing with the shadow run die pool problem. Right. What well, also statistically skews success towards um, having greater skill and 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 a higher attribute because mm -hmm. adding that static value of eight. Um, you know, if you if you were to graph it, you know, the more dice you roll, the closer you come to that um, statistical mean average where it becomes harder to roll maximum success because you're just rolling so many dice. You know, mm -hmm. it, it almost becomes an impossibility. You know, it's it's almost impossible to roll 20 dice and get them all to be eight. Yeah. You know? um, and, 
and it really should skew towards, you know, if you have a very high skill rating and a very high attribute rating, you really should succeed. Um, and, and some of that comes from some of my frustration with the D20 system, uh, where, you know, you roll and you're like, I should hit this guy, all I got to roll is a four, and I rolled a three. Great. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what I mean? That's, and again, yeah. not fun. Not fun. It's frustrating. Uh, so, yeah, so that is to, to, to uh, also to cut down on the dice clutter, right? You need 10 dice to play the game, and that's it. Mm-hmm. You don't need anything else. You know, you need a set of 10 eight-sided dice. Um, I mean, ideally, you don't necessarily have to have 10. You could have four that you roll multiple times. No, it's, it's really up to you. But I, I guess, you know, all of us, you know, as gamers, we got dice sitting around. Yeah, anybody who says that they have enough dice is lying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got, I got a whole Crown Royal bag full of, you know, dice that i've been saving from multiple you know things and places and you're probably not going to let anybody else roll them because of that because of the old superstition of cursed dice uh i'm not that superstitious really um (laughs) i i have a i have a couple sets that i like and a a couple sets that always roll poorly Mm -hmm. and i'm more than happy to loan those to other people wait so you loan people the cursed dice oh of course (laughs) Oh, well, I um, I can't, I can't, I can't speak too harshly on that kind of strategy. <laughs> um, something else, something that I did notice when I looked at how you have character creation set up, is you seem there seems to be a lot of theming around the around the number eight. Mm-hmm. Um, was that something that you always had always had in mind of the- of theming around these? two pairs of this two pair of four approach or was that something that kind of fell into place no that was that was by design um you know i that is part of the numerology of it and you know Mm -hmm. the the, the, you know the 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 triad of the eternal cycle Mm -hmm. where uh you know you can things go on and on and on and on forever um but that that is part of that that whole overall theme and this this apl- this applies to a- to attributes to um I'd s- I get the feeling that this is that that whole cir- that whole circle of eight thing is something that is an all roads lead to Rome approach with how you've designed things. Right. It also makes it easier to figure out if you're a- if you're ever asking how many of something there will be there'll be three five or eight. Mm-hmm. I mean that's you know that that's and and it kind of. I mean, and, and it's thematic too, with you know, eight-sided dice, and you know, it it, it all kind of goes together. Um, yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to calling and um pa- and path, um. Now, obvi- obviously, that obviously that's meant to be the um the connection to the um connection to them to that character being a guy and hero, but. What, but um, what would be, what would what would you say though that particular thing would define when it comes to when it comes to the sandbox? Um. Okay, so so your calling is more of a, a metaphysical thing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas your your path is 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 more of a concrete approach to. I I, I would I would sum it up like this. Your calling is where you want to go. Your path is how you're going to get there. Yeah. And even, but even with that, it's both both calling, calling path, and and the like would ha- would um would have more in common with archetypes than they would with character classes. Would that be correct? Right. Exactly. Um, I know. I don't really. I never really the idea of a character class. Uh, just because it kind of pigeonholes you into one thing, mm-hmm. right? This this is just what you are. Yeah. You know, I'm a fighter. Well, I mean, that's great, but I mean, okay. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Again, not not great narrative storytelling there. Um, 
and and giving you the the, the choice of really th of three paths, which open you up to you know different avenues of gameplay and different avenues of mm -hmm. character progression, where you know two players in the same party or in the same group could choose the same calling and choose two different paths and really be very different characters. Yeah. I will. I will admit when I look at when I look at how you describe the trinity of ephemera, viscera, and impetus, for a strange reason, I end up being and ju and just the way um apotheos works, for a strange reason, I end up getting flashbacks to of all things exalted. Okay, yeah, I, I can, um, I can kind of see that. Um, basically, like when you look at the trinity of 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 the three, um. Mm -hmm. Viscera is drawn from your animus, right? And it's based in, and it flows through your body. It's, mm -hmm. it's bodily prowess. Um, whereas ephemera is drawn from your umbra, and it's the power of your mind. Mm -hmm. And and like the the way that you know that the triad, because there's again there's the, the, the one of the over um, repeating themes is triads of things, mm -hmm. right? Um, where you know where you, you generate that impetus by following your calling and, and using your core aspect and awakening your apotheos, you know, um, and you know empowering it mm -hmm. through your own body because your apotheos is bonded to your animus and your umbra, but your corpus is you. Mm -hmm. That's you. You. You know what I mean? You're. you're that's you being you. Uh, I almost look at it like. Your apotheos is a silent passenger. They're like watching you in a movie. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you're, you're their favorite character in a book. Yeah. You know they they're along for the ride. Really is what it comes down to. All right. That may, that can that can definitely make sense. Um. Now, given the fact that you're doing an you're do you're you're doing a setup that uses combinations of attributes and skills, and some something that I can that I always end up that I always end up seeing in one form or another, and some games are more guilty of this than others. Is not be, is the balance of importance between attributes and skills. Um, I think a good a good example of this sort of thing is why, as much as I like the roll and keep system from Legend of the Five Rings and Seventh C, it does lead to an issue where attributes become more important because. By by increasing that, you're getting extra die to roll and keep instead of just extra die to roll. Right. And when it com when it comes to when it comes to guy and Enoch, um, how do you how do you have it set up so that a so that um attributes or skills don't oh, don't um become t more useful than the other. Um. Attribute and skill together goes into the rule of 10, right? Mm -hmm. Where either one of those is important, but the two of them together become supremely important. Where someone that's naturally very gifted will succeed at things at a good rate, and someone who trains very hard will also achieve you know, some level of success all the time. Uh, someone who trains very hard and is also very naturally gifted mm -hmm. um, because that's going to push their dice pool over 10 um, is going to achieve a, a much, much higher level of success because of those plus eights that just keep getting added on rather than mm -hmm. rolling. Um, it is easier throughout the course of character progression to increase your skills than it is to increase your attributes. Um, your attributes will increase pretty slowly where in the beginning, you'll probably see yourself having higher attributes and lower skills where down the line, those skills will start to overtake the attributes um, because they just increase faster. All right. That, that, makes, ma sense. that makes sense. Um, when it comes to now, something that I did, something that I did notice when it came to, when it came to get, when it came to gear is, in a, in in an odd way, you s it seems that you have um, something not exactly the same, but very similar to the point-based background setup that was that's in a lot of storyteller system games. 
Mm-hmm. Was yeah. that was that intentional to make it so that people don't have to um, go go through the de- go through the detailed minutia of every single piece of equipment that they're carrying around? Um, yes and no. And I actually was talking to some guys about this last night. Mm-hmm. Um, it never made sense to me why, like everything should be fair and balanced, right? At character creation, everyone mm-hmm. should get the same opportunity. And it never made sense to me why. Uh, let's let's take a classic example of second edition AD and D, right? Mm-hmm. Why does the fighter get some plate mail, and the wizard gets nothing? You know what I mean? Like w- that that doesn't make that doesn't make any sense to me. That that should be a choice that you made during character creation. Like I made that choice to start with this thing, uh, and and you made the choice to start with this thing. You know, mm-hmm. something like mentor. You know. Uh, has you know a, a you know an in, 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 in-game um, advantage because you know people and you're in a post-apocalyptic world mm-hmm. uh, where knowing people is important, <laughs> having friends is important. Um, is it and you know you can you can kind of balance those out. You can say okay, I want two arms and three mentor, and you know I want one point of wealth and I want two eidolon. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but that's the idea of choice, and you'll see that through character creation that I, I'm not going to tell you what you have to do. I'm just going to tell you what you can do. You mm-hmm. can do all of these things. You know, you can spend your flex attributes, attribute points wherever you want. You can choose any skills that you want. No one's going to tell you which ones you have to take. I mean, you could play the, you know, the, 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 the quote unquote spell caster, decide you want a really nice weapon and, and, and put some points into melee and in, into a melee skill. Mm-hmm. Go for it. Who, who am I to tell you you can't? You know. Yeah. Now, when it ca- when it comes to the when it comes to the um, it's funny you mentioned the me- the um, the whole th- the whole thing with doing a spellcaster because of the way a- the way aspects and spheres work wi- work within within the setup, specifically mm-hmm. the fact that unlike unlike say D- unlike say a D and D style spellcaster there is there is a lot i see a lot more control in terms of in terms of how one's supernatural abilities um grow and develop but are still based around theme so it's not a case of just pushing the, someone into the deep end of the pool and saying swim damn it yeah well i i i purposely uh went out of my way to to eliminate any redundancy in mm-hmm. that um you don't need a quote unquote spell in this case, an evocation. Uh, you don't need four of them that heal. You just need one that gets better over time. And and as a player, you get it and you use it and you learn how to use it and you're like, okay, I know how to use this now. Mm-hmm. Um, moving on, um, you know, and it'll become more potent as I increase, you know, in, in Animus Mark and I get more aspects in my facets of aspect, uh, aspect progression uh, advance. Uh, but yeah, the, the I want it to be simple. Like like when you look at them, your mm-hmm. first your first degree evocations are all simple, right? No no real complex mechanics. No, it does this. Oh yeah, and this and this and this. Mm-hmm. Just it does this. Because you're gonna get those four at character creation, and, and you're gonna get those four uh, evocations and four boons, eight abilities of things that you can do. Plus you get the passive bonus. That's enough for a new player. That's enough things. And then you can start buying more things as you progress, you know, through the game, Mm -hmm. uh, adding your repertoire of of things, path aspects, secondary aspects, however you choose to to spend the Theos that you get. Um, But yeah, it's all choice. It's all, you know, what, what, what you choose. And given that, given that emphasis on choice and the, and the, um, and the different spheres when it comes to, when it comes to the phys- when it comes to the physical and mental um, a- use of it, use of aspects, I'm cur- I'm curious if if um the way you set it up, if one of the design goals you had when you set it up was so that two people who lean towards physical could ha- could um express could express their abilities in completely different ways without dipping into each other's territory. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And that's where it goes back to even two characters of the same calling choosing two different paths. Mm-hmm. Um, could, could you know? Could they they will have a little overlap in their core aspect, 
but they get different path aspects. So they're very, they're very, very different, you know? Um, but the, the, the same thing, you know, someone who chooses calling a valor is different than someone that chooses calling of aggression, you know, mm -hmm. where you go might versus expertise. These are kind of polar opposites of each other, even though they're both meleeers and they're both, you know what I mean? They're mm -hmm. just doing it different ways. Yeah. Now, I did want to I did want to touch on a bit when it comes to the, when it comes to the um, combat system specifically how you're do, how you're handling um, turn order, what with what well, with um what you're referring to as active rolling time. Now, I know I've made I know I've made some World of Darkness comparisons throughout this, and this and this is going to be one of them. Because obviously, when I, obviously the thing that comes to mind, especially with the whole circle thing, is the ticks that are that are used in um, in world in World of Darkness and and the storyteller system as a whole. How similar and how different is active rolling time comparatively? Um, it really winds up being kind of night and day because the storyteller system really wasn't designed for combat. It's really designed for role playing. Mm -hmm. uh, Combat is really supposed to be an aside. Um, it's really not supposed to happen a lot. Um, where in this case, you know, when you go when you go from a scene where you're in pretty much freeform role playing, there aren't a lot of rules when it comes to the role playing in a scene. Where we go to medium crunch, where we go, okay, now we get into active rolling time. Now we're gonna really monitor what's going on, mm -hmm. tick by tick. Um, that way, you know, when there is th things like player death, it's fair. You know what I mean? It, it, and and it, it, it's orderly and it makes sense. And, and the rules are, you know, say it's, it's equal for everyone. But um, it, it's in such a way where you can manage your time in combat. Which that, de that definitely makes that definitely makes sense. But given that I'm can I would it be fair of me to assume that you're not doing a, you're doing a setup where um, the actions that the actions that you take are going to determine the turn order for the next round. Uh, no, turn order is always um, it, it just rolls, right? Mm -hmm. Now, not every character is going to have an action on every tick, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're going to take an action, and then that t that action is not going to be available to you for a number of, of ticks afterwards, right? So. So say you take a uh, melee attack action on, on one, your mm -hmm. delay is four, it becomes available back to you on five. Mm -hmm. Now you can take other actions in the meantime, you just can't take that one. Um, now you may get into a situation where either you don't want to take an action or the, or one an appropriate one just isn't available where you're just going to pass your turn. All right. um, and that should happen on a fairly regular basis, especially where it's, it's kind of like a horse race. Everybody's um, clustered up at the beginning, but mm -hmm. then they start spread themselves out. And that goes into like the tactical aspect of it, of knowing where you are in the order and knowing where other people are. Yeah. But even with that, would it be fair of me to say that this is not a, that this is not a system that lends itself to, um, map to map based combat. This is more theater of the mind style. No, you, you, you should, I, I would encourage anyone to use a map, um, particularly, um, for the, the movement aspect of it, mm -hmm. uh, taking move actions and things like that, um, and, and, and range. Rain, range is important, um, particularly when you start talking about uh, you know ranged combat, thrown and launched, and, and, and evocations, because they do have a specific range and a specific like target area mm -hmm. where I want to know who's within 10 feet of me right now because you know I'm going to use this ability and it heals allies within 15 feet. So I need to know if I need to use this now or if I need to move first. Uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, I can. I can. I can see where you go. Where you're going with that? It's give. Um, now, when it comes, I'm guessing that when you've done when you've done play tests, you've had the um, you've had the well, for lack of a better term, combat wheel um, off off to the side that um detail that details. Where where each is where each is going to go? Each player should have their own, mm -hmm. um, and they they should be using it to actively track their own actions. Um, and and yes, and uh, the 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 realm guide should have their own also, and they should be tracking uh, you know enemy combatant action. 
but yeah, because you want you want to know, you know, not only you know what actions I have available to me, but mm-hmm. when I'm going to get stuff back, right? When when is my melee attack going to be back? When is my dodge going to come back to me? Um, and give, the, given how given how that's set up, I'm cu- I'm curious if in some playtests there were there were players who leaned a little bit um, defensive. Um. Yes, and the playtesting has been not that extensive, so we're we're still kind of working on that. Mm-hmm. But yes, defensive combat is a ver- is an a- an absolutely viable strategy in combat. Yeah, one hundred percent. In fact, I almost kind of lean towards it. Um, a- anything that's not offensive, uh, I made it a little bit overpowered. Um, you know. Uh, because you made that you made that active choice. You you, you invested in fortitude. You mm-hmm. invested in resilience. You invested in finesse. Uh, it's not helping you kill things necessarily, but it's helping you survive. Yeah the main the main reason why the main reason why that kind of thing came to came to mind is whenever there's some sort of limited resource, um, players will try and be defensive with it as as much as they as much as they can. Um, whether whether that be whether that be some sort of re, some sort of resource for items or or even a resource when it comes to spells the whole ra- the whole rainy day conundrum, um, right. and when it com- when it comes to when it comes to the set the setup here, what I was curious about is if you had situations where pe- where people found playing defensive was too useful. Um, I have not seen that, no. Um, but again, it, it it maybe should be too useful, um, you know. And 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 I and I kind of in in my mind when I think about it, I think about you know like movies and and you know heroes and and cinema and you know like that that guy that's out there, uh, you know, with his parry and he's so much better than everybody else, right? So he's parrying everything, right? Mm-hmm. Except when he gets into the, you know, the boss combat where the other opponent is of equal skill to him, you know. Um, one of the things that I really kind of wanted to 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 get away from and and to make sure that you know you feel the hero, especially as you progress and you get you know, you become more powerful. Those lower level enemies really are of no threat to you whatsoever, mm-hmm. uh, and they and they shouldn't be. And, and and you know you should because you you are a hero you know you're 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 so much more say superior um, to this your you know your average bandit that you would run into on the road you know yeah. uh, he's, he's of no threat um, and that is, is really shouldn't be taking up a lot of time in mm-hmm. combat <laughs> really should just be dispatching him and moving on and I'm ge- I'm. Uh, I may now. I may have. I may have not seen it, but where where would you say, where would you say where would you say your game le- lies when it comes to the lethality question? Hmm. Do you con- do you uh, consider do you consider combat to be highly lethal, or do you consider it to be a little bit less so? Yes and no. Um, on average, no, um, but. Again, it's a, it's a really like a story. The the combat should accompany the story, mm-hmm. right? And you should be using it as a storytelling uh, tool rather than just you know we're not just dungeon crawling, right? Mm-hmm. The, the encounter should mean something in the story. Um, where I mean, sometimes player death could happen, you know, and especially when you're putting yourself into you know some of these situations where you know the the whole idea of being a party is that the things that you might encounter are, are so much more powerful than you are as, as an individual player. You know, um, I don't, I, I kind of go back and forth on that sometimes. And I, I, I would leave that up to the person running the game as to, you know, their aversion to player death and lethality. Um, you know, some, some people will just say, you know what, the dice do what the dice do. If you die, you die. And there's validity to that argument. Mm-hmm. And then there's others who will say, you know, I'd really like the character's death to be narratively important. He died defending the bridge so the party mm-hmm. could get away, you know. Um, and there's validity to that also. So it's really, you know, you got to gauge your players and you got to gauge, um, you know, yourself as the person running the game 
and kind of, again, goes back to rule number one, it's got to be fun, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if it's not fun, nobody wants to play. Yeah. Now that does that does bring me to how you how you're setting up encounters and how um, monsters would be set up. Um, I realize that this is something that is a, that is a very down the road thi thing thus far, but when it comes to when it comes to balancing out encounters, um, what how how do you how do you typically go about it? Is it more based on how many people are at the table, or do you have something else in in mind? Um, <clears throat> balancing out an encounter that's that's a tough one. Um, mm -hmm. That's I guess you you got to give it to to the person running the game to kind of gauge their players because mm -hmm. you know there are varying skill levels of players and there are varying you know amounts of experience. You know, like, I mean, I have I have a core group of players that I've been playing with forever that play well above their character's potential and level. <clears throat> but mm -hmm. that's because they know how to read between the lines when it comes to the rules. They're not necessarily metagamers, but they, they, but they know how to work the mechanics in their own favor. So their level of challenge I would put at a little bit higher. Whereas, like, my son, who's nine years old, doesn't, you know, he's nine. I have to make his challenge level a little bit lower um but i would i would uh and i'm still kind of working on on how to phrase this uh in a, in a way where uh, you can you can kind of read it in the rules and say okay do it this way um but i would say you'd want to kind of go you know light medium heavy where mm -hmm. you know the medium encounter is is based on you know the animus mark of your players added up this is what they could probably handle whereas i would go you know the light level is slightly lower than that, and the heavy level is slightly higher than that. But the encounter should be within this range. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I can de I can definitely get I can definitely get behind that. Um, now when now when it comes to when it comes to adva when it comes to advancement, are you le are you leaning more are you leaning more towards a a um, level or a tier based approach or are you leaning more towards experience as currency okay so you have you have an animus mark right mm -hmm. and you start an animus mark or apotheos mark uh apotheos mark one right mm -hmm. that is the recently awakened apotheos that is bonded with you to creating mm -hmm. you the guy and hero um you achieve apotheos points by playing the game right Nothing to do with combat, nothing to do with uh, anything like that. Uh, you simply gain one Apotheos point for playing in a game session. Mm -hmm. And then you know, between one and five for achieving a milestone in the story. Whatever that milestone happens to be, small personal goal, quests completed, wh whatever, whatever the wrong guy decides that that milestone is. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, you tally, you accumulate those points... Uh, to increase your animus mark, right? Mm -hmm. So you need four to get to the second mark. You need nine to get to the third. You need 16 to get to the fourth. You need 25 to get to the fifth. And and it, it goes up and up and up. It gets progressively a little bit more difficult to advance, mm -hmm. which I think is appropriate. Um, so it's not exactly linear. Um, but you can achieve those apotheos points simply just by participating in the game right so you know that by sitting down at the game at the table or even doing this online playing this game session is going to get me at least one i'm going i'm going somewhere right mm -hmm. um because i've experienced that as a gamer that lack of progression frustration that really makes you want to quit playing where it's game session three and I'm still level one and I'm like, Hey man, uh, what are we doing here? Cause I'm never going to get these awesome powers that this person wrote in this book that I need to be level 10 to get because it's going to be 37 weeks before we get there. Let's move on. You know? Um, All right. And when it, and given that, given that would it be fair to say that once, once you go, once you go up a mark, then, there would be certain points that you could distribute to upgrade yourself. 
So when you when you um, uh, ascend one animus mark, mm -hmm. you're going to get three skill points. You're also going to get three theos. Now those those three theos are the currency with which you are going to increase your uh, path, secondary, and tertiary aspects. So you can take those theos, you can spend them, you can keep them, they, but they are a currency. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can save them if you want. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't, um, you know, but, um, you know, a path aspect, first degree, is one theos. You could buy three facets of a path aspect right there when you, when you increased, you know, in... in Apotheos mark. Um, you get three skill points. Those three skill points need to go into three separate skill categories. Um, so you could choose one martial skill, one mental skill, one social skill to increase by one point. Um, with the caveat that until you go, until you move into the next tier, which would be Apotheos mark six, uh, you can only increase the skill one time. So the next time you increase in Apotheos mark you're going to get three skill points again, but they need to go into three separate skills or three different skills. So you could choose block the first time, and then you could choose dodge the second, and you could choose parry. You know what I mean? But you couldn't just go dodge, 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 dodge. Progression right. skill takes time. Yep. You know? All right, I can I can definitely get I can definitely get that. Um, and I'm going to leave it to the person running the game as to how, uh, you know, how much they want to focus on on which skills the characters are using so i would say in my own personal game i'm going to want to see you increase skills that you're actively using during the game session yeah uh, some people might just say you know what just spend them more yeah in that okay. regard what be what is the difference between apotheos mark and apotheos tier so every every five marks moves you up one tier your tier is tied to your sanction and that, this I don't think we've discussed at all. Mm -hmm. Your sanction is an ability that's specific to your calling. So at every mark, you're going to choose one ordinal from your um, sanction. There's mm -hmm. eight. You'll be able to get five of them. When you move from tier one to tier two at mark six, you unlock the second group of eight. Um, so you moved up to that tier. Um, those generally... Uh, those those sanctions apply a lot to your aspects. They mm -hmm. enhance some of the things that you already have. They make them better than what anybody else could get. You know, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, if you chose uh, calling of synergy in the second tier, one of the aspects, you know, your your fusion is your core aspect. You can get fireball, right? It's two A is fireball. Um, well, if you choose to boost that with afterburn. Uh, it causes your fireball to have a concussion effect, and it also uh, has as it, uh, what, how do I phrase this, uh, a reverb effect where it, you know, crashes back in on itself after it explodes. Now, anyone can get fireball if they have that aspect, if they, if they choose to, to purchase it, but nobody can get that reverb effect except you. Mm -hmm. So it makes you a little bit more unique. Which, which is definitely something I I approve of because it's very it's very easy for sameness to happen at at high le at high levels when everybody's um when there's nothing really new to unlock in in some games. Right, and that's what I want to avoid. I, I I want to avoid everybody just being this gigantic generic. I have everything and I can do everything and I can cast all these spells and I can stealth and I can you know what I mean like mm -hmm. like you should still be you. Right, it's just it's just just a a much more powerful, better version of you. So I think I think it'd be fair I think it'd be fair to say even with that, the idea that somebody's going to be able to get all in their in their potential pool is impossible. Right. Oh no, definitely definitely not possible here. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to make choices, and those choices are going to define you. But you're not going to be able to get everything. There's 16 aspects. Uh, Four active facets per degree, three degrees. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's 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 over four hundred different abilities. You you're, there's no way you could get that many. Yeah, and something when it comes to the skills, one thing that I was curious about because I don't I don't I'm not sure if I see this within the um, character sheet mockup that you have that you have presently. But do you have you considered the possibility of um, skill specializations, or is that not or is that something that wouldn't fit? 
it doesn't necessarily fit, but I thought about that. Um, in the subsequent portion of the, 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 the book, um, there is a, a realm guide of how to run the skills and how to use the skills. Mm -hmm. Certain skills require a certain minimum rating to do certain things, right? So, you know, performing field surgery requires medicine of a certain degree, whereas the guy that has one point in it, he just can't do it. Like, he doesn't matter how he rolls, he's, you know, he's not performing open heart surgery. Um, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and that's going to tie into things like crafting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's a minimum that you need in order to, to make the thing. Yeah. You know, it's not just a matter of you rolling high enough. I mean, you know, you, you, you can't you can't just, you know, m magically come up with knowledge that you don't have. You're not MacGyver. At least not yet. <laughs> right, not yet. Exactly. Um, and... When it comes now, when it comes to when it can, when it comes to the uh, se when it comes to the setup for for um I for for skill for skills, the more I think about, it, the more I realize that yeah, it wouldn't fit because if you because specializations that that more dice means more means your means someone's potential die pool is that much closer to hitting the ten. Right. And while at high levels I can see that hap hitting the ten more more often, it is a case of I get the feeling that even that um that the setup that you're trying to go for is not one that rewards hyper specialization. Right. Um. Exactly. A jack of you want characters should be a jack of many trades, but not necessarily a jack of all trades, and not necessarily the other side of the pendulum either. Well, right, and that's why, like, during character creation, you know, there's 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 five skill categories, eight skills per category, 40 mm -hmm. skills. You're going to choose 24 of them to put one point into, which reflects the fact that we're all sort of good at a lot of things. You know, we know a little bit about this. I mean, I'm not a gourmet chef, but I know how to cook. You know, I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not a grandmaster with a weapon, but I could probably stab somebody if I had to. You know, like... And then you're going to get eight flex points to make a couple of those skills better. And that reflects the fact that there's a couple of things that you are better at than average, right? Because that one point is really basic proficiency. That's that's as, as, as low as it goes. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and, and and yeah, you should. There should be a lot of, especially when it comes to like social skills. Um, I mean, I know some people who have no social skills, but um, most of us, you know, a little charm little guile, little command, you know what I mean? Like a little bit of it. Some things you might be a little bit better at. You might be very charming. So you start off with three points in charm instead of just the right, the one that somebody else, you know, puts their one point into. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to see a setup really where everyone's a super specialist and it's like, okay, time to talk to the guard, send in the social guy, you know, like, well, well, I mean, why can't anybody go talk to that person? That's that's bad role playing, you know. There have um, been many times where I've where just before some just before something goes down, I've see, everybody goes, okay, okay, who's high, who has this particular skill or who's high in this particular um ability, and it and it just completely narr it just is a completely narrative um kill zone because, well, when pe when when you have a group of people in fiction who are who are trying to solve a problem, nobody nobody stops like that. Right, exactly, um, and I and I think of it too in in the in the narrative description of you role playing, you know, you have all these skills. There's 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 eight social skills, and you, there are many ways to achieve the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just how you how do you describe what you want to do? You know, I mean, do you want to sweet talk the guard? Do you want to try to empathize with him? Do you you know what I mean? Use your empathy to be like, oh, please let me in. You know, like. Or do you want to try to browbeat him, use your intimidation to be like, hey, man, it's going to go bad for you if you don't let me buy. You know, like, that's your character. That's you playing your character, you know. So instead of, you know, really telling me what you want to do, describe to me how you want to do it. What mm -hmm. is your method of execution of the action that you're going to take? Yeah. And admittedly, that's that's a mindset that I don't, that I don't see often. In fact, um, what, the way you described it, 
for what for reasons that I don't that I don't quite understand, even though it's coming from my own head. I end up being reminded of Alpha Protocol of all things. <laughs> okay. Um. Some, even even though that game was was very very flawed, you did you did have this mindset of you of be, of being able to take di take different approaches with um conversation and all the things that could um modify how a conversation can go. Right. And in a and in that in that same way the um. A lot of a lot of games I see that the the um, emphasis is more on what you're do, what you're doing and not how you're going about it. Well, well, right, because that that's that's really good role playing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and and that's you playing your character. You know, my character is very charming. You know, yeah. even though me as a player might not be very charming, mm -hmm. I, I I can't necessarily role play that because. Um, you know, I, maybe I'm not, you know, I'm not my character, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, playing your character to their skills rather than like using those skills as just kind of dice, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I don't know, that, 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 that to me is a much more interesting way to play. Um, and, and, and when I, when I run a game, um, I try to eliminate as much of the dice rolling as possible in social role playing, really only when it's important. Like when we're, does does this interaction matter and does failure matter? Mm -hmm. I don't need to roll dice to talk to the bartender, and I don't need to roll dice to order a drink from a waitress. You know, like that. That's you know that, that's a little too much for me. But I I imagine that when dice do need to be rolled, you'd rather that there are multiple potential ways to go about it than just one right and 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 that's because it's that then you then you also get into the metagamer who's just like ha 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 i'm gonna dump a bunch of points into this one thing that does everything you know and, and it shouldn't do everything no um because when you when you have that sort of met and obviously um metagaming and metagaming and min maxers are I think in I think in one form or another inevitable. It's not it's not a matter of good or bad design. It's just how people work. They're going to, they're going to look for whatever th whatever is going to give them an advantage. Mm -hmm. And I get the feeling that when you were doing character creation, you wanted to make it so that there weren't that um no matter what decision you made, you were going to have some kind of weakness. Right. Every, everybody's got to have a weakness. Mm -hmm. You know. Nobody's. Nobody's perfect, you know. What I mean? they, that's that's again bad storytelling. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, and 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 those choices, like I said, you should be good at things, and you should be okay at things, and there's some things that you should be bad at, because um, you can't have it all. And, and if you try to get it all, you're going to be good at nothing. Yeah. And look, if I, if I want if if we wanted bad storytelling, well, I pro well, I'd probably be writing for Hollywood. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> unfortunate. I mean, the cinematic aspect of that, where and going even back to the whole like good and evil and all that, that that's all bad storytelling. They consider it good cinematography, but I consider it terrible. Yeah, I admittedly I was making that joke just to be a smartass, but yeah. <laughs> so it's true though. Well, as a great man once said, "Truth is the greatest comedy," <clears throat> but. I, now I'm get I'm guessing that the com that the coming weeks and months are going are going to hold more playtesting. But beyond that, what do you have in mind for the future of Guy and Enoch? Are you are you planning on are you planning on um, oh, eventually yeah. doing this doing it as a full PDF release, or are you planning on um, crowdfunding in the interim? All kinds of plans. Um, there's, um, you know, once we're once we're through alpha testing, and mm -hmm. then we go to full open beta. Um, which is, you know, I call them the unmoved movers. Those are the people that I don't personally know. I've never talked to. I've they they're literally just going to read this and go and see if they can figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, which I, I I think they should be able to. How you know you have a viable product when I don't. It's it's one thing for me to run my game. It's it's another thing for someone 
who's never run the game before, or maybe you never even ran a game before, um, to sit down, read something, understand it, and then play a, a game session with it. Um, I will do um, that once we hit beta, and, and it won't be too, too much longer on that. Um, we'll put that out like on drive through, pay what you want, whatever, it's free. Just mm -hmm. download it, play it. Um, and then I will do a PDF release, and I do want to crowdfund it um, because I have a lot more things um, that I want to do. Right? All right. Uh, a ton of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to put source books out. I want to put, um, I mean, I already have in, in my mind in, in, the, in the design process um, two follow-ups to this um, because you're only seeing one third of the story in core rules. You're only seeing the Varangian Alliance. You're seeing one of three major factions. You're, you're not seeing the Sunset Pact yet and you're not mm -hmm. seeing the Outsiders. Mm -hmm. um, those get introduced as you go, you know, book one goes um, Patheos Mark 1 to 15, Book 2 goes 15, uh, 16 to 30, uh, and then you know 30 to 40 is where it taps out. Um, but I have a lot more content. Um, I actually didn't even use like, and not not even half of what I originally wrote for for the aspects. Um, so there, there's there's a lot more. There's a lot, lot more to come. Um, I liked the idea from I, I liked what White Wolf did with World of Darkness with source books, right? Uh, Chicago by night and Berlin by night, mm -hmm. um, where as you don't really write a module, you really just write a like a, a setting, right? So these are people, places, and things. This is this is what it is. Um, you write the story. You know what I mean? Like you you tell me what's going to happen here. I'm just going to tell you who lives here, what the terrain looks like, what potential enemies they could run into who likes who, who doesn't like who. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you make the story based on your characters. Cause I've always found that like modules are written for like a generic character base. Mm -hmm. I need a tank and I need a healer and I need an, uh, an arcane spellcaster And I need, you know what I mean? I need these things because this is how this was written. And then you wind up having to tear it apart and put it back together to make it work for your party of three wizards and a rogue. You know. Yeah, and I I can def I can definitely see that. Would you would you say in that regard that that what you plan on with expansions is more akin to sandboxes rather than a um theme park? Yeah. Yep. So you're gonna get and and I it, the the map's not put into that PDF, so I can't it won't make a ton of sense. But mm -hmm. you're gonna get because this is a post-apocalyptic fantasy world. Uh, survivors are huddled into cities, so it's almost a, an alliance of city-states. So you're going to get Veliar, and you're going to get um, Kordgar, and you're going to get Stonespire, and you're going to get Kayo, and you're going to get um, Brunmarin, and you're going to you know all these little city-states, right? Mm -hmm. And the surrounding area. You know what I mean? So uh, this is a story that can happen in this place. Here's uh, 50 pages of, of of again people, places, and things. Uh, potential plot hooks that you could, you know, you could have, uh, and then you write your story, you know, because I don't want to write the story for for the person running the game. I, I want you to, I want you to write your story. I'm going to tell you the overall overarching story of, of of the world, but you you got to tell the story of the players and and what's going on in the game. All right, I can I can definitely um get I can definitely get behind that particular that particular um setup. With with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come on to the show and brave the hell of time zones to to uh, come to arrive here and enjoy the insanity. No problem at all. Happy to be here. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, I the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Excellent. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!